Hello and welcome to another Airbrush Asylum how-to video. In this video we're going to show you how to do a whole heap of skulls using black over a silver base on a panel and then we're going to put an orange candy over the top of that. You're also going to learn how to mask out certain areas and use paper templates so we hope you enjoy the video. To start with we've got an aluminium composite panel which is already black so you can get these in numerous different colours. You've got to go to your local sign supply shop to get them. We've used the KC10 House of Colour Wax and Grease Remover. And just using some paper towels, I've wiped that on. And then I'll wipe it dry. Now switching to my KC20 Post Sanding Cleaner, which is a water-based uh, wax and grease remover or degreaser, whatever way you want to say it. I've sprayed a little bit of that on over the top of what I've just cleaned off, which was the KC10. Um, and I've basically just sprayed that on, paper towel, wiped it off, and then wiped it dry. Now I've got my grey scotch bright pad, and I'm just scuffing the surface, so we want to get a bit of tooth in it. The reason I use the water-based one after the um, solvent-based degreaser is because I like to make sure that all the residue has been removed because if you don't completely wipe the surface dry when you use the solvent-based uh, uh, wax and grease remover, there could be residue and it could come back to bite you later on in the project or whatever artwork you're working on, especially um, with these sort of projects that are automotive surfaces. So I've sanded that, given that a bit of a scuff just to rough up the surface with that grey scotch bright, and now I'm back to the uh, water-based post-sanding cleaner by House of Colour and I'm just wiping the residue from the scotch pad, just wiping all that off so that my surface is 100% clean. Um, so you don't need to totally remove the shine, we just want to dull the surface and give it a bit of a tooth. If this was an actual uh, tank or helmet or any other automotive project that we were doing for a client, then um, I would actually prep it a little bit differently. I'd probably use 800 or 1200 wet and dry sandpaper and make sure that I totally sanded it flat. Um, this is just a sample panel that we're gonna show a customer, so that's why we're not too worried about being 100% crucial. All right, so now that we've done that and prepped our panel, I've just masked up the edge. And what we're doing now is I'm just adding silver into my LPH ADI water sp uh, mini spray gun. Um, so this is just a automotive silver. I'm pretty sure this one is the Orion silver by uh, House of Colour. But you can use any silver will work as a base. Okay, so just getting that into my spray gun. Uh, the spray gun's just, it's a nice gun to use to get a bit of quick coverage. All right, so we're going to use... Um, You'll see this used a few times, a spray gun, and especially for metallics, um, it sprays a lot better than what, what an airbrush would for such a larger surface. So you can see I'm just, uh, I don't know, probably maybe 15, 20 centimetres away, if that. Um, the pressure's not super high because it's an HVLP, um, so I'll probably run it at about, I don't know, 30, 35 psi. Just gauge what, what you need to set it at. Um, to make sure that you get the, the desired end result. And just 50-50 uh, overlap, I'm just coding that. So when I say 50-50 overlap, when I do one pass, the next pass is 50% overlapped onto the first, meaning that the overspray covers the first pass by 50%, and then so on and so on. That way you don't get any of those sort of train tracks through your, um, through your spray pattern. Okay, once I've done that, I've let it dry and you can just see here I've got a pressure pack. This is actually a custom can that we've filled with um, House of Colour SG100 Intercoat Clear. So you can also put this in a spray gun, but I just thought I'd show you that we also do these in cans. And um, it's kind of handy for our students as well because a lot of them buy the cans off us so that it makes it a bit easier for them if they don't have a spray gun um, or they don't want to tip it into a spray gun. So. It's just a different option, but a spray gun will obviously work. Later in the video, we will switch back to the LPH80 to spray the intercoat clear on, so you'll um, see us using both. What I want to do now, now that the silver is dry and the intercoat clear over the top has also had a bit of time to dry, um, basically I'd probably allow 30 minutes to an hour roughly. So what I'm doing now, using the tape measure, I'm just in a sharpie. I'm just marking out um, on the masking tape of the panel 
Uh, just some guidelines, so where I want the uh, fine line tape, the green fine line that I'm going to use to mask up. I'm actually, in this video, I'm using a 5mm fine line, but um, once we've done the sample panel, um, we decided to switch to a 3mm for the actual Harley that we um, painted with this particular design, but at least you'll get a good idea of how, um, how we go about this. So, what I'm doing now using my fine line tape, which you should be able to get from an auto body supply shop, just a local one, um, you know, that sells automotive paint. They should have all these sort of tapes for you. So basically I'm masking off on top of the silver. So this will then protect the silver. So once we've done all our artwork, um, you'll remove this at the end and it will leave a perfect silver uh, pinstripe essentially. So. So there's different ways you can do it. You can do it by brush, but when you're doing metallics, obviously, you can get a metallic uh, pinstriping paint, but I'd still, uh, I still prefer to do it this way, and plus I'm not the best with a pinstriping brush at all, so I'd have to outsource that if I wanted it done. So I thought a good way to show you is the way I would do it, which is using the tape. So hopefully it's helpful. So I'm just trying to get my curves. You can see I laid it down to start with and I wasn't 100% happy, so I had another go. That's the beauty of the tape. Um, you can sort of keep repositioning it. Um, it will eventually, if you do it too many times, you will start to lose a bit of the tackiness and um, the curve might be compromised. But generally, they're the really, really good quality tapes can be you know, lifted and placed back down numerous times. So. Um, I'd probably recommend if you are going to get one, make sure that it is a decent brand um, and you know something that's not too cheap, otherwise you might have all sorts of trouble. Okay, so you can see here I've um, laid it out. Okay, I've checked all my curves and I'm happy with the way that tape's laid down on the panel. So what I'll do now is I'll prepare to start, like I'll just press down on the tape and then I'm going to start masking off the outer part of the uh, panel so we want to basically just work on the inside uh, panel there which will get all the skulls so now with some masking tape I'm just taping off the background so that I don't get any overspray on there so just um, cutting sections taping them down and making sure that I cover everything take your time make sure you get all the edges correctly and try not to um, stuff up by overlapping over onto the, the tape. You'd be surprised how easy it is to do if you're not paying attention. And remember, overspray travels. So even with your joins, just make sure that everything's covered. If you're unsure, I always recommend just stick another piece on top just to cover over a bit that's uh, joined. So you can see there, there's some little bits and just make sure I get all those. Don't miss anything. Again, take your time, check over everything. Sometimes it, ha it helps to sort of lift the panel up like I just did, just to make sure that you're, um, you're not missing out on any bits and pieces. Okay, so what I want to do now, because we're going to have all different size skulls and we're going to repeat certain skull shapes, um, I thought the best thing to do is I'd just jump on Google, print yourself a whole heap of different skulls, and then we're gonna make some paper templates and then you're gonna freehand off that. So we're really just using these templates to get the general outline. Um, so the eye socket, the nose socket and the outside shape of the skull and then everything else will be rendered freehand. You can still refer back to these references if you like, um, but I just thought I'd show you a different way of doing it rather than going out and purchasing the uh, freehand templates that are readily available. They do work as well. But um, for this particular bike, we wanted to um, just have a go with something totally different. So from time to time, we'll use this method on other artworks as well. You can see here on this skull, we've modified it a little bit. So I haven't allowed for all the, the gaps in the teeth. So we can just tweak that as we paint. So again, it's really just to get the, the shape of it and the sockets, the eye sockets and the nose socket and the outside of the skull. So I'm just using a photo paper which is a little bit uh, thicker so it makes it a bit easier to use for a template and use it over and over. So you can see there that's what we want and I had all different uh, types that I'd cut out so now we switch to a black and binder so meaning that it's mixed 
uh, with a transparent base so that keeps it a little bit more translucent so this will be our our first step and then we'll come in and render with a darker tone like a pretty much solid black later so I'm just using my template and what I'm going to do is just spray lightly in the eye sockets the nostril and around the outside perimeter of the mask so that'll give me a, a basically an outline and then you'll see the other templates that I've made as well so that's what you should have and on the silver base it'll um, it's transparent for a reason so that we don't eliminate any of the silver so one of the biggest mistakes that people do on anything metallic is they'll use a white now the problem with white is that once it's clear coated it'll it'll go chalky because it eliminates the metallic that's underneath so we won't be using any white for this at all because we want to just use black so that nothing eliminates the silver base so that when the candy goes on later on candy being fully translucent um, the silver will be able to shine through and it'll look very impressive so that's why we do that if you ever do want to do highlights on a metallic base uh, then you can use white but you would then spray a little bit of white pearl which is transparent over the white which will then give the white a shimmer and not allow that chalky appearance uh, to destroy your base color which is metallic so hope that makes sense so you can see I'm just um, using my various paper templates just to get my outside edge and the sockets and that way I can I virtually draw with these so that I'm placing them where I like building the artwork so take your time and experiment if you make a mistake again you can always go back silver over the top of it and um, that's virtually your eraser so so I probably had I don't know half a dozen different skull uh, templates that I've made up with the paper all printed on the photo paper so it's a bit thicker to use and again if you want if you want it one, facing one way or the other you don't need to make two separate templates just flip it around so saves you a little bit of time I just made a few different sizes of the same style as well but it's just a good way to get a general idea of where you want to go with everything and then you've got your outlines another good thing is then that way you're not drawing on with pencil because pencil again if you're using transparent colors and you don't totally eliminate the pencil it could show up and it could ruin your artwork later on once you uh, have cleared it and put candy over it and everything you'd hate to find a few pencil marks that are still showing so that's why this method works really well so I'm just continuing there different skulls having some you can already see I'm building some layers by placing certain skulls on top the key is also don't airbrush right over everything if you want it to appear in the background like that one just did and then this one will flip the other way and I'll render that one on top so that one looks like it's floating and it's further forward so and we can help to build all that with drop shadows and everything later on so we're just continuing with those templates nearly finished with uh, marking out all of our skulls so you can see here they're all done so now using my CMC plus micron um, I'm now using a black which is um, pretty much a solid black now just reduced down and I'm going to start to render each individual skull okay so we need to establish some sort of light source and then um, we're going to keep running with that all the way through so we have some sort of consistency you can see here I'm starting with the eye socket so you want to be up nice and close and really sharp on those edges just to define the edge but you notice I'm kind of doing like almost a uh, graduated tone so darker at the top and lighter down the bottom just to give the illusion that there's some depth in those sockets um, a lot of people they just basically black out a skull socket and it tends to look a bit too flat so by leaving some of the um, the underlying color and and having those different varied uh, shadows in there that'll create a bit more depth and give give a bit more of an illusion that it is three-dimensional so just remember that when you're painting um, you know try not to just hit an area completely solid 
uh, it's a lot of the time if you sort of build it up then you can always go darker but you, it's very hard to go lighter so just keep that in mind less is more and you can always go darker later on all right so we're just going to keep building the shadows so i'm working on the other eye socket there establishing uh, the nose as well to give it that uh, 3d element so i'm bringing the nose uh, up in front of that uh, eye socket, just the top of the nose there. You can see the bridge where I've um, ran, run that sort of uh, line to separate that up. Running some detail uh, bone texture and everything in, as well as some cracks on the top of that nose and just uh, gradually going in and establishing all of the elements. So you can see I'm using um, what we've already got sketched out from our paper template and just now randomly adding in shading just to make things look a bit more three-dimensional uh, wherever I want some texture I'm, I'm putting that in as well as I go so remember it's a skull you can be you know you can vary it up a little bit you can have cracks in there holes in the skull you know all different things so as we do more we're going to go through each individual skull and get that done so they're all going to vary a little bit, even though a lot of them are taken from the same paper template. We are going to um, change them because we're just doing them all freehand. Uh, one of the hardest things to do uh, for, well, for most of my students, and I'm sure it'll be the same for most airbrush artists, is the teeth when it comes to the skull. So just um, practice that. We do an exercise in our classes where I actually use the other end of a cotton bud and that sort of helps students. If you sort of hold that down, spray, uh, aim on the top of it, it'll give you that sort of half circle, uh, perfect half circle, which works quite well to establish those, um, those teeth. So you can try that as well if you're finding it difficult freehand, but really the key is to do it freehand and basically um, just practice, you know, just do lots of different freehand exercises to get the feel for the airbrush and it may take a little bit of practice but skulls are good to do because if you do make a mistake generally you can um, hide it, turn it into something, create a crack or an extra divot or whatever. The key is as well uh, is always just to keep painting even if you think things are going a bit pear-shaped and it's not turning out that well. Um, if it's going really bad I always suggest to students to just have a breather, walk off, have a break for a second, then come back with a fresh mind and that can sometimes help. But um, generally speaking, you know, the, that's the best way you're going to learn is if you are making mistakes. So especially when you're starting out with the airbrush, I always recommend just um, try and really finish your paintings. Even if, you know, they're not going to plan, just keep going with it and usually by the end you can... You know, even if you're not 100% happy with it, you can look back and go, okay, I've learnt quite a few things off this. So just um, keep that in mind as well. So you can see here I'm working on the teeth again, establishing that lower jaw. So really just using what we've got as a guide and then freehanding off that. That's one of the biggest mistakes I see as well when people use skull templates to actually render the skull. Um, so what they'll do is they'll virtually buy a template that they like, hold it onto the surface, spray a real heavy colour over the top, whether that's black or a real dark grey or even any, any, any sort of other colour, but just to, they use it as a solid, um, solid colour straight over the template and what it does is it looks way too masked. There's no freehand elements into it at all so it just looks like someone has got a stencil and sprayed through the stencil which really anyone can do so you don't want to get in the habit of that remember they're called freehand shields for a reason and that is because you use them freehand to establish all your, your areas so virtually it's, for, it's designed for people who struggle to draw and um, or if you're doing something like this particular project where there's lots of repetition as far as we want numerous skull um, images or artwork so then that way the template helps to just establish your sizing and gives you a bit of an understanding of where everything's going and then from there you can freehand off that so hopefully that makes sense so just continually working in those skulls adding in the details you can see I added some cracks as well so I've got all different little aspects going on 
I'm working on this eye socket now, so you can see this skull is kind of underneath the one on top. Um, so the way I've established my light source is at the, uh, the basically the lights coming from the top left. So you can see the shadows are sort of sitting heavier on the right hand side, the lower right hand side. So um, try to keep that somewhat consistent through your artworks. So that way it'll it'll all sort of look uniformed. Um, but I'm just working that that color in, sketching it, pretty much sketching with it. So. I still run my paint reasonably thin. Um, that way it's, it tends to um, allow me to go darker and almost use one color as you know numerous tones. You can also see I'm just revisiting those teeth, so I'm sharpening them up. I'll do that a lot too. As I'm painting, I sort of tend to jump around from, from artwork to artwork. In these videos, I tend to try and make an effort to stay in one spot uh, quite a bit longer and finish that off, but Usually when I'm painting and I'm not filming, um, I do tend to move around quite a bit, especially if there's numerous artworks that I'm painting. That way I just can virtually build all of them um, together and then just keep looking at them and, and uh, re-evaluating to see if I want to go you know, heavier or if I'm happy with the way they're looking and you, know, you can tweak things as you go. So you can see I'm just establishing all my tones and I'm working reasonably close when I'm doing the tighter um, shadows. But when I want a softer blend, you'll see that I'll move a bit further away from the surface with the airbrush. Uh, that way you can control that a bit easier. It might be hard to see because it is sped up a little bit. But um, you can also see I've just I added a few more cracks then. And I'll come in and I'll start darkening off an area or adding a bit more detail. You can see now working that nose socket, I was up nice and close to define the edges. And again, I'm not just coloring it in. So not just doing one solid bit. I'm also leaving that bone section down the center of the socket. And sometimes I'll dust over the top of it um, towards the top of the nostril, just to blend that down a little bit, similar to what I do with the eye sockets. So you can see there how, again, I didn't just color it in solid. So keep that in mind. Don't just um, completely color it in black because it will make the skull look very flat. Remember, we want to shape them and make them look three-dimensional so that it gives the illusion of a whole heap of um, 3D skulls. And then once that candy orange goes over the top later on, you'll see you'll get that real depth coming through. So they'll look like they're virtually buried underneath uh, the candy, which is the effect that we want. So just again, building up all my tones. So my air is on constantly. So I don't turn the air off at all. All I do is I use my trigger finger, pulling back a little bit on my trigger finger to allow a little bit of paint out and moving the airbrush at the same time. You don't want to just stay still because then you'll start to build up paint too heavy in one spot and you could get a run or it could also blow out on you uh, with the air blowing it, you know, and, and dispersing it. So. You've got to keep the air on all the time, just back and forth with your trigger finger. It may be hard to see on the video, but that's uh, how I sort of work all my detailing and um, all my airbrushing. So it's like, it's a constant, constant sort of thing that I go through. So just working on the new one now, another skull here on the left. So this time just pretty much started with the teeth, now working in the eye sockets. So even the method that I use is very similar, but I might start in a different section depending on what, uh, which skull I'm painting and where it's situated. There's no real rule to it, it's just paint whatever you want. But if you're more confident to start with all the eye sockets, by all means, go through and um, do all your eye sockets and, and nostrils first because they're the most forgiving areas and then uh, maybe leave the, the teeth to last if you have to. That way you can uh, come back and tweak them if you and, and also get a bit of practice before you do them because the, the teeth are quite difficult, especially if you're doing them on the scale that these skulls are. So you can see how much variation you can get from even just using one tone. 
you can see the first uh, tone that we put down with that um, transparent base mixed with the black. When I say transparent base, it, that can also be binder um, if you're talking about automotive colors. So depending on which you're gonna use, whether it's water-based paint or if you're gonna use all automotive, like solvent-based paints, then it would be a binder. In the water-based products, a lot of the time they call it a transparent base. So it's virtually anything will work, like the, the SG100 Intercoat Clear from House of Color which is the same one that you mix your candies up with, that works really well. There's also other brands that um, might be a little bit more reasonably priced. Um, they work well as well. So it's just finding whatever brand you're using in the solvent-based paint, there's usually a colorless binder that you can use, and that can be used to add transparency to your paint. So virtually what it does is it extends it, so you mix it up with your transparent uh, base or your binder first, then you mix up, you add your reducer to that to your desired um, reduction ratio. And then what will happen is if you spray it heavy with the, um, with, say for argument's sake, we're doing it with the black, it doesn't matter how heavy you go, it will only go as, as strong as what you've mixed up. So it gives you a lot more control, plus it allows you to give um, numerous tones to add that definition. So it's a really handy thing to use. So just working away, continuing to add shadow, definition and textures to the skulls. So you can see I'm just uh, working on the teeth there. So remember up close, less paint with those areas. Just take your time. Because it's a panel too, you've got to be careful how far you pull back on the trigger when you're up close because um, you can easily spider out the paint. So uh, you can see I've just added some more cracks, just defining uh, some of those raised section above the eye sockets there. By zooming out, you can see how many we've, we've done so far. So now just again, starting with the same sort of procedure. So up close with the airbrush and we want to define the sockets the eye sockets like we did with all the other skulls. So you can see it's um, after doing so many, you'll really start to get the feel for, for how to render these skulls or how I do it. Um, by all means, you can tweak it and um, vary it up a little bit to make them look a little bit different. You might have different references that you've used, which in turn has made different paper templates. So just play around with it and create your own version of this. It doesn't have to be exactly the same. But if you prefer to follow the video and um, you know run with that sort of an idea and have it very similar, if that's going to help you out, by all means do that too. So you can see I've sort of got a bit of a system that I use. So I start generally with the eye sockets and the nose socket and then just work my way around and uh, add more detail as I go. So just remember to be up close wherever you need to to get that sharp edge and then I tend to blend off that so that way I add my shading and any dimples that I want in the skulls. So just take your time, it does take a little bit of time to, be, uh, to build each skull so you don't have to rush it. Obviously the more detail you put in the better. But just keep in mind, um, yeah, you are going to candy over the top of it, so you just add as much as you as much as you want, and it's still going to give that awesome effect when you apply the candy. So just adding all the shading, blackening out sections. So anything you want in the distance, I'm pretty much. Uh, doing a fairly heavy shadow there which is knocking that in the background so if you can kind of remember that as a rule of thumb that um, if there's something that's sticking up or you want it to stick up then don't add the shading if you want it to be pushed into the background or if you know that that area has a um, is like a shadow will be cast on that area because of the light source that you're following then by all means shade that and that's why I also start with the eye sockets and the nostril 
because that way I can go solid, almost well, almost solid with that um, that particular black, and then I can gauge all my other shadows off that. So I know that you know a shadow that I might want on the um, jawbone might only be sort of 50% of the shadow that I've got in the eye socket, as in 50% um, strength. So that way I can I can sort of say okay. That's how dark the, the um, color that I'm using is gonna go. So that works with every color. And then you can marry that up um, and sort of paint it to 50% of that um, wherever you want it a little bit lighter. And then you sort of work out all your other shading off that. So just have a play around with that. It's, um, you know, the reference will tell you everything, but if you are making it up, then just sort of try and work off um, you know maybe references or even if in this case if you have skulls you know if you want to get the actual skull like a 3d resin skull if you've got that um, then you know place that and and look at it and look and think about the surfaces that you're painting and where the shading will sit where the highlights will appear so all these little things will help to make it look a little bit more realistic in this particular case, we're not going for photorealistic skulls. We want that still, um, I suppose, semi-cartoony sort of skull because, um, yeah, we just like the customer like that style. So just, yeah, whatever, you, whatever you're trying to achieve. So don't feel that you have to do photorealism. It's not necessary if that's not what you want to do. By all means, if that's something you do want to achieve, well then, yeah, you can, you can most likely do that too. So it just takes a little bit of time. You can actually see here with this particular skull, and I've left this in, I have deliberately not edited it out. Um, I actually had the teeth that were a bit too high, so I've dropped them down and I've just added some extra shading to kind of hide that. So if you do make a mistake, don't give up on it. Just keep going with it. That's what a lot of people make the mistake. They they sort of make a mistake, then they'll either throw the panel in the bin or sand it all off or wash it all off. Especially when you're learning, it's always good to, um, you know, if you do make a mistake, just keep going because that's the experience that you're going to get from how to fix that. That's what gives you experience for everything else later that you're gonna that you're gonna paint. So keep that in mind. So don't just sort of um, give up on it. If it's a real bad mistake, a lot of the time I'll urge students to, you know, walk outside, have a bit of a break and then come back to it. That way you've got a fresh pair of eyes on it or leave it till the next day. That can help as well. I do that um, quite a bit too if, if something's frustrating me or I'm not getting those tight uh, sort of edges or I've made a mistake for whatever reason and I'm trying to figure, figure out a solution. Um, a lot of the time I'll leave it think about it overnight and attack it again the next day. So um, by all means, use that to your advantage if you have made an error. And you can see here, I've been airbrushing for nearly 20 years and I was just getting complacent with painting the skulls and wasn't really paying attention to what I was doing, just sort of going through the motions. And then I noticed uh, when it was too late that I had those teeth, that teeth line was a bit too high. So, but, I just kept painting, made it a bit darker, added some shading, and okay, it's not perfect. Um, it's definitely not the best skull on the panel, but luckily this is a sample panel. Um, so this is another reason why you do these things first, and then in the back of your head when you are painting the actual um, artwork that you're doing for someone, or even if it's for yourself, if it's the final piece and you've done a bit of a practice and you've made a mistake, well then more often than not you'll remember that and you hopefully won't repeat your mistake. So it's not a bad thing though. Don't treat it as a bad thing. It's all learning. So especially for those that have just started and picked up the airbrush, it's gonna happen. Um, you're gonna do this, you'll probably spider it out. You know, you'll pull back too far on the, on the trigger and paint will go everywhere. It's all part of it. Just practice, practice, practice. Um, as I said, this is a harder surface to work on because it simulates automotive. I do recommend that students practice on things like um, t-shirt material or even, you know, if they buy cheap t-shirts and just um, a white t-shirt works great. Or if you want to use my other method of building up, you can also get black shirts and then um, use the white to shape the artwork like I have done in many of my other videos. So depending on what you want to do, but 
honestly, it's a great way to practice. Um, I remember when I first started, I used to just paint with the airbrush on t-shirts and I'd do cartoon characters, like real basic um, characters and they were actually quite challenging to do because you had to make sure that your lines were all perfect. So it definitely helped my line work after doing numerous t-shirts and um, even just getting a roll of t-shirt material and doing like 10 or 12 characters in one, one session. Just uh, block colours, outlining them, shadows, highlights and they were done. So um, yeah, it's definitely something that I recommend. So. You can see I'm still building the, the shading. Each skull is getting its own little different personality. So keep working in that detail. You can see my airbrush is varying heights quite a lot. So whenever I want it a sharp, clean edge, I'm up close, less paint. Um, if I want a shadow or just to sort of haze in a bit of um, shade, I'm further away from the surface. So remember that too. It's all it's not done all at the same height. And that's sort of why I wanted to do this uh, video and not speed it up as much as some of my other ones. I wanted to, and it, it, I know it's a repetitive thing, but um, I'm hoping that by doing it this way, it's gonna help out a lot of people um, that they're seeing this, the, a similar skull being rendered over and over and over and um, you know, that way you can basically watch this video and just keep practicing and practicing whether you do a stack of skulls in one artwork like this is, or you're gonna scatter them and, you know, run fire off them or whatever it might be. Um, or even if you just wanna render one skull, it'll just, you know, keep showing you the methods that you can go through, especially when you wanna do a skull like this, just using black over a silver base and then later on when we put the candy on, you'll see uh, how impressive that looks. So, um, yeah, hopefully by doing the video like this and not speeding it up as much, you're going to get a lot more out of it. So, uh, we'll see how, what sort of response we get off this one. And then, um, look, I might do that, do some longer videos uh, going on in the future. So, uh, we sort of gauge it a little bit on what's popular and what's not. So, yeah, hopefully you do enjoy this. So, you can see... I'm still adding more, more shading, popping it out, making it three-dimensional. It's all the little bits and pieces that really make it. Try not to paint it too flat um, because obviously then you're gonna lose your 3D element. So even this particular skull on the side, which most of it's chopped off, um, shouldn't be, you know, shouldn't compromise what you add into it. So just paint it the same as all the others. So just again, up close around the edge to get that to define the edge of the skull. The socket's always a good place to start because even if you go too heavy, you can kind of eliminate that by uh, going back over the top of it. Giving it a bit of a mean look there. So again, noticing that the airbrush is moving back and forth. Even though I've slowed this one down a bit, it might still be hard to see that, but um, up nice and close for the teeth to define all the teeth. And then that um, section in between each tooth, a bit of a shade. So just um, take your time. Don't rush it. You can even experiment with other things too, like um, tearing bits of paper, holding them on to create cracks if you're not confident doing it freehand with the airbrush. So don't feel that you're limited just to use the airbrush, okay? So even, you know, if you want to experiment with um, adding different textures, if you're using automotive paint, you could even try using a bit of thinners on a cotton bud and just um, sort of once it's sprayed out, hitting certain areas that'll create and bring it back um, to the original color. 
if you are going to do that, make sure that the base silver has a clear coat over it so that it's protected. And then you can kind of render back over the top and that can give you a really cool effect. So there's all sorts of things you can um, experiment with. So you can see we're almost complete with all the skulls. So again, I started with the sockets. I think it's good that they're, you know, they're facing different directions, all different shapes, you know, getting a good feel. And that's what's great about using that paper template idea, or if you've got the, um, the Mylar templates, you know, even better. They can be reused over and over and over, but, you know, this was just a different way to show you. And for people at home that don't have the, um, the, the Mylar ones or haven't purchased them yet, uh, they can just to show you that you can still do a whole heap of stuff by just using um, a simple printout, cutting it out and off you go. So remember the templates are really just a guide, they're not to spray through and get a complete image, you still need to add the airbrush um, to it with freehand skills, it's not all about just spraying the gaps of the template and there you go. So. See, doing the back of the cranium there. Changing up. Changing it up a little bit, adding another crack. You can see I've got those, um, sort of, a, it looks like it's a crack, but joined in three spots, and I've left the gap in the middle to create a little section that's still stuck in there. So you can do the same, but then if you black that out, you're going to get the illusion that that piece has fallen out. So, a bit of shading on the forehead there, going a bit darker and then deliberately not too smooth, so it's a bit textured. You can see I've left a bit of an edge as well to show that it's 3D, so that's disappearing back around the other end of the skull. So, second last skull now, again working on the eye socket. Not worrying that the top part's masked, just painting it as if I'm still doing the majority of it. By this stage, I think most people would be getting pretty confident with doing these skulls. So they're not overly difficult. Um, the reason being is like I did a mistake earlier, you can kind of hide things. So if you do make a, a bit of a stuff up, turn it into a hole, a crack, whatever it may be. But it's just a great practice exercise and it just, yeah, it looks effective at the end. And skulls are always popular. You can't go wrong with skulls. So just detailing those nose sockets. We're nearly done here with the skulls now. Bringing it all together, adding some shading, deepening the other shadows. Again, moving around with that airbrush further away so I'm not saturating and, and uh, creating all wet areas where I don't want them and always building the paint up too. So even in the solid sections of the eyes, I'll, um, I'll coat it. I won't just smash the paint on so it starts to drip. So using the air to dry it as I'm painting. So that's why the air's on all the time and just pulling back on that trigger. Running some shade in between the teeth. So you can see I'll, the first pass is like a quick, just to get the outline and then I'll go back over and redefine them. You can try and do it all in one hit, but um, for those people who aren't super confident at this stage, it's a good way to do it, so. Just a few more details, a few more imperfections in the skull. Back to the teeth, more shading. Now we're gonna move on to the final skull, which sits on top of the one below it. It's really just the top half, the bottom jaw's completely missing which gives it a pretty cool look. So again, you get the idea, shade it all in, 
Render the eye sockets. Build your shades. Up nice and close to keep it tight. I'll just jump back to the previous one to add a few more details. And coming back to this, now we're going to attack these teeth on this skull. Again, further detailing them, running the shades in the middle. Now we're adding some shadows, like almost drop shadows. We'll do the same underneath the teeth in a second, where it sits on top of the skull's head. That looks like we'll be coming back for that part. Now I've switched to the Gerald Mendez Texture Effects 2 template, just the regular size one. You can also get these in a mini series from Art Tool. So I'm just adding a bit of texture in the middle of each skull. So in all the gaps that are just uh, remaining silver, just spraying through it, holding it on there and building up some uh, texture. So it's a cool effect. You can even use this to render some of your skulls. Like there's a, you'll notice it might be a bit overspray that hits a few of the, um, the skulls, foreheads, or, um, their craniums, and I'm not too worried about that. It's all part of the effect and once the candy goes on top it's um, just going to add add to the uh, detailing that I'm adding to all these skulls. So you can see I've gone through and filled in all those gaps and now I've uh, just as an experiment switched to the uh, Gerald Mendez Texture Effects 1 template. And now I'm going through and deepening, like just adding some more darker textures uh, to the skull heads again. So you can just play around with this. They're really, really handy templates. They also work really well for zombie skin. So. These are probably some of the ones that I use the most. So you can see I've got quite a bit on that skull's head there. Now that I've finished up with the texturing, I'm just coming in with some more drop shadows on the skulls. So just to lift them off the background, again, up to you if you want to do this. Might be a little bit hard to see on the screen, but you can see there's a bit of shading going on. Sorry about that glare in the top left hand corner. Not only does the, the shading lift the skulls off the background, but I'm also adding it in to any sections where the skull sits on top of a previous one. So you can see there I've just uh, lifted that one off the one underneath. Just to give it a bit more depth. So again you can play around with this. Remember when you do it to be up close nice and sharp so that you don't get overspray over the whole uh, skull that you've just complete, uh, completed. So just take your time, move around the artwork and just run those shadows underneath so that you're lifting them off the background. So it doesn't really matter that there's texture there like I did before, I've, I've added the texture in first and then I'm shading on top of it so you'll see it which is good because you'll see a little bit of the texture through my drop shadows so it's always nice to have uh, the texture built up in the background you could also do this first before you start painting any of the skulls but then you've got to remember 
you're going to have that texture showing through each skull. So I didn't actually want that. I just wanted a little bit of texture here and there um, and to fill the, the gaps uh, in between the skulls, but not entirely over the skulls. So keep that in mind. So you, look, you can experiment and see which one you like better. But you can see even um, in between the skulls, I'm just checking back over areas that I think need a bit more attention. So I'll, I'll go back in and define those if I think it needs to be a bit darker or sharper. So this is a good time to do it. Remember that once the candy goes on, you cannot change anything that you've done. So this is pretty much it. Um, it'd be different if you weren't candying it, you could always come back and, and tweak things. So again, just putting another drop shadow in, re-establishing that cranium, a few shadows in there just to break it up a bit. Again, wherever the teeth are, just going in carefully, darkening that edge off, creating a sharp edge and then blending. So moving further away from the surface and then uh, not pulling back as far on the trigger. So just going through, finishing off the last few here, and then we'll be uh, near enough to moving on to the candy. Take your time, don't rush it. You'd hate to get up to this stage and have it all perfect and then, uh, you know, try and hammer through the shadows and you get overspray on everything and it starts looking a bit blurry and yeah, so just take your time. Pay attention to your details and your edges that you want to keep clean. So you can see I keep stepping back, looking at what I've done, coming back in, adding a little bit more. Apologies for the shadow, it's a bit hard to see on that. But hopefully you get the gist. So again, moving around, going from skull to skull. Adding a little bit here, a little bit there. No real rules. If you think it needed more cracks, put them in. So nearly finished. A few more drop shadows. And I think we're calling it done. So there you go. You can see what it looks like now with all the texturing, all the skulls are finished, rendered. So now we're ready to unmask and uh, we're going to be doing the candy very soon. But first we need to finish off this panel. So now with the LPH80, I'm going to add some candy into that. This is a PPG orange candy, so mix it as per your specs. So whatever candy you use, make sure that you mix it according to what they recommend. Uh, strengths you can adjust by adding more of the dye if it is a dye. Some of them are pre-mixed, so depending on what you're using. This particular one was a dye mixed with um, a binder, so we could control the strength. So I think probably three decent coats with this uh, mini LPH 80i water spray gun will do the trick. So you can see even the first coat, how much that artwork changes. So you can sit, still see everything that I've done, but um, it's just adding that depth and that glow. Just hold it up for you for the camera so you can really see. Even the little textures are showing up. So I'm just checking over that. Your overlaps also need to be a lot tighter when you're doing candy, so they're not generally 50-50. It's not as obvious because we've got artwork underneath, but if you're doing a flat panel, it's crucial to get your overlaps correct. So candy is actually really hard to paint. Um, so just keep that in mind if you are just doing a flat panel. But for this particular purpose, it's not too bad. You're working over artwork. So just, um, I suppose the key is don't go too dark, but also don't keep it too light. So it's, it's kind of up to you. It's hard to see with the camera. 
but um, once this had been cleared, you're getting that full on depth coming through, especially out in the sunlight. You can see the uh, metallic shining through all the skulls and everything, so it's pretty impressive. So we're just doing another coat. Just getting nice overlaps. Remember to keep the gun level as well. Don't twist it away when you're doing your passes because then you'll get heavier sections and lighter um, sections on the edge. Now I'm switching to the SG100 again, which is in the pressure pack can that I showed you earlier. We used it earlier in the video and I'm just sealing in that candy. So I'm putting that intercoat clear over the top, which is the SG100. Now that I've done that, we're going to unmask the background. So I've allowed the candy to dry now. Keep in mind candy, if you're not doing this in a spray booth, candy does take a bit longer to dry. So don't rush it, let it dry. If you need to, leave it overnight, come back in the morning, and then you can mask over the top because we do not want any of this candy to lift off. If it lifts off, you, it's going to be extremely hard, if not impossible, to correct and fix. So we don't want to do that. So now I know that's dry. I think I left it for a couple of hours, but it was decent temperature in the workshop. So I'm using a large bit of application tape, tearing a few pieces off. It's probably a medium tack application tape, which is the same stuff that you use to apply vinyl with. So you can get this from a sign supply shop. I'm just peeling off a couple of sections, covering what I've done. So it's becoming a positive mask covering what I've done, making sure it's all stuck down on the edges. And then with my X-Acto knife, I'm carefully, and I say carefully with a brand new blade, cutting on the actual um, fine line tape that we laid earlier in the video. So that's still keeping the silver section masked up. So remember, do not cut too heavy because you could cut into the silver and then there's an issue. So you're better off doing two or three light passes um, and make sure that it peels off clean like, like it just did there. So now that we've exposed the back of the other part of the panel, I just again go over with my fingers. You can use your fingernail as well, that helps. Just carefully rub on the uh, pinstripe tape to make sure everything's stuck down. And I'm switching to a DNA Helix base coat, which is Black Magic. It's actually got some uh, metallic in the black, so it's got like a bluey sort of sparkle to it, which is pretty cool. And I'm just gonna apply a few coats of that with my LPH ADI water to the background. And then once that's dry, we'll unmask and we'll show you what the uh, panel actually looks like completed. So the first pass on 50-50 overlap again, trying to keep it nice and even, sort of medium wet coats. The pressure's not super high, so it's reasonably um, low. Mix it up as, as per your specs and just get good coverage. And if you're unsure and you think, oh, it hasn't really covered, give it another coat. You're always better to, to be safe rather than um, finding out that when you unmask it and you've finished everything that, oh God, I didn't cover it well enough. So keep that in mind. So I'm happy with that. So now I'm carefully going to remove the application tape from the candy section. So pull it, try and pull it back on a 180 degree or close enough to, so that you get less chance of lift off. It shouldn't lift off if it's dry enough. Okay. So now that's removed. We need to now carefully remove the pinstripe tape. Now, because this is candy and we've, we've had intercoat clear over the top and everything, it can bridge onto the tape. So what I like to do is uh, resting my the edge of the blade on the edge of the artwork and on the tape, carefully cut along the candy edge so that even if it did bridge, when I peel the pinstripe tape off, it's not gonna lift. Because if it lifts, you're gonna have the same problem. So I'm not too worried about the black, that's fine. Candy just has a, a tendency to do it. It's a possibility. Not every job it'll happen, but this is a good way to safeguard yourself. Obviously, if you're doing this, be careful with the knife and don't run it into the rest of your completed artwork. So take your time and make sure that it's cut nicely and don't rush it and don't slip or any of that. So 
this is real crucial just make sure you get all the edge cut and then you can carefully again pulling back on a 180 degree angle peel the tape off and you can see that's exposing the original silver that we we uh, protected when we first laid this pinstripe tape down so also don't be aggressive when you when you're unmasking it just take your time and peel it back on itself that way is less chance of lifting I tend to do that with all masking tape so it just gives it less tack to pull up any of the paint but because we've protected areas with intercoat clears and everything it should help to make sure that uh, nothing lifts up you can also two pack clear it and then wet sand it and all that sort of stuff as well to that'll totally protect the area but um, we're sort of showing you the way to do it without having to go to all that trouble now all I'm doing is removing the original masking tape to create the border so it gives it a nice neat finish and there you have it the skull panel is complete All we need to do now is one last coat of Intercoat Clear. This time it's in my LPH 80. The reason I did that is I wanted to get a real decent uh, wet coat. You can see this pretty much simulates almost a two-pack clear, or at least for the camera. So nice and careful with your passes. And just get that on nicely. And that's it. You can see all the skulls rendered, the candy applied over the top, and the silver pinstripe. So thank you for watching, hope you enjoyed the video, and we look forward to seeing you next time for another How To Airbrush Asylum video.